We here at the AHA are closely monitoring the developing situation in the Middle East and any potential threat from Iran against the U.S., which could impact U.S. health care, either directly or indirectly. We're fortunate to have our own internal expert on cyber and terrorism threats to help interpret world events, U.S. government alerts, and what it all means in terms of risk to our members. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast brought to you by the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hederly, senior writer with AHA. John Regi is our senior advisor for cybersecurity and risk. John spent nearly 30 years at the FBI with assignments at CIA. He has a great deal of experience focused on counterterrorism, Iran, and cyber issues, and John brings the right experience at the right time to assist our members. John, thanks for being on this podcast today. My pleasure, Tom. Great to be here. Let me just um, to plunge right in. If if Iran does decide to exact some form of cyber revenge as this this tension goes on, what is it capable of, and what are our capabilities uh, in in response? That's a great question, Tom. But before I answer that, perhaps uh, just to kind of level set and give the state of the current situation uh, regarding the potential threat, the U.S. government and of course we concur that at the moment we do not believe there is any specific credible threat of either a physical or cyber attack from Iran against the United States. However, as the government recommends and we strongly concur, it is a time for all cybersecurity professionals to remain vigilant, uh, including in healthcare. Although there's no direct threat against healthcare, we are concerned that Iran could retaliate against U.S. critical infrastructure, including U.S. health care. So let's speak about Iran's capabilities, as you mentioned. First off, it is widely agreed that Iran could not be successful in a direct head-to-head military confrontation with the United States. However, Iran does possess extensive offensive cyber capabilities almost what I would characterize as first world offensive capabilities. And unfortunately, they've demonstrated that over the past several years. Going back to 2012, it is believed that Iran was responsible for a very destructive cyber attack against the Saudi Aramco, crippling, almost crippling their oil industry for several weeks. Iran has also demonstrated their willingness to conduct destructive attacks in the United States. Back in 2014, Iran was responsible for a cyber attack which destroyed the networks of the Sands Casino Hotel because they were unhappy with political statements made by the owner of the hotel. Iran also harbors criminals, cyber criminals, which are engaged in all types of attacks around the world, including ransomware. In fact, just last year, the FBI indicted two individuals residing in Iran and I'll say being provided safe harbor in Iran to conduct these global attacks. Now, in these ransomware attacks, known as the SAMSAM ransomware attacks, uh, they actually targeted U.S. hospitals. So quite concerning there. So in sum, don't believe uh, they have the capability to confront our U.S. military. However, Iran does engage in terrorist attacks around the world and has done that previously. We don't think, again, based on the information that we've seen and have uh, what the government alerts are, don't see that as an imminent threat. Cyber attacks, first world capabilities, we need to be really vigilant there, Tom. You mentioned a moment ago that hospitals have been affected by Iranian cyber attacks uh, in recent years. Can you tell me a little bit more about what happened there, and is there any possibility of that happening again? Sure. Tom, let me clarify. First of all, those attacks were attributed to Iranian criminals unclear if they were directed by the Iranian government. So we want to make that clear. Uh, Two individuals were indicted uh, in 2018 for developing and deploying a variant of ransomware known as the SAMSAM ransomware. And just to explain, ransomware is a type of malware that encrypts data. So instead of the adversary, the criminals trying to steal your data, 
They're trying to deny you access to it by encrypting it and then demanding a ransom payment for the decryption key. So as a result of the SamSam uh, ransomware deployment, it did affect U.S. hospitals. We don't know if that was intentional or not. But the bottom line is any attack on U.S. critical infrastructure uh, could, could impact a hospital. And we believe, we believe that a ransomware attack on a hospital is a direct threat to public health and safety. Um, so we're concerned about ransomware. We're concerned about wiper attacks. And we also know that Iran has engaged in extensive cyber espionage and cyber theft of intellectual property. Also in 2018, numerous individuals that were residing in Iran and that were contracted by the Iranian government engaged in a massive cyber spying campaign targeting U.S. universities, including academic medical centers, to steal intellectual property. So our members have to be concerned over a number of issues regarding Iran. What kind of red flags are out there for hospitals to, to keep be aware of? Right. Yeah, Tom, so there's numerous red flags out there. Unfortunately, hospitals, like most organizations in the U.S., are under constant attack almost daily. And one of the things that we're seeing in relation to the potential Iran threat is increased scanning activity originating from Iran. So in other words, there's increased scanning of U.S. organizations' computer networks that have been, uh, have been attributed to Iran or originating from Iran. Now, I've had this question quite a bit. They said, hey, John, why don't we just block all IPs uh, emanating from Iran uh, through a methodology known as geofencing? And my guidance back to members is that will only have a very limited effect because the bad guys are smart, whether they're nation state sponsor or criminals. Uh, they know that organizations will try to blacklist uh, IPs originating from countries high-risk countries like Iran. So what they do is they use proxies. They use, they spoof their IPs. Uh, they use anonymizers. Fairly easy to do, and it'll make it appear that the attack or the scanning is actually originating from a different location. So fairly easy for the adversaries, whether, again, nation state or criminal adversary, to disguise, to spoof the origin of the attack by using um, service, anonymizer services, proxies, so forth. They could make the scanning or the attack appear if it's originating even from a friendly country or even from within the United States. When I was at the FBI, it was fairly common technique to, uh, for criminals and nation state spies to compromise an existing and legitimate IP address within the United States. So they take over that IP and use that to launch the attack against a, against a U.S. Uh, entity. So from, from the victim perspective, it, the, the activity appears to be originating from a safe U.S.-based IP. Mm -hmm. So lots of challenges there to try to keep up with the adversaries. Is there any particular reason for a cyber attacker to go after a hospital network in the first place? It seems like there would be juicier targets out there if you really mm. wanted to, uh, uh, you know, do serious damage to the U.S. economy or infrastructure. Yeah, it's a good question, Tom. And as we've seen, unfortunately, in the past several months, attackers are specifically targeting hospitals because they know that they have to pay if they're shut down, if they don't have the ability to restore they understand that U.S. hospitals may be a soft target. Again, they have to continue to provide care. They have to treat patients. And quite frankly, their cybersecurity maturity level defenses may not be as rigorous and robust as other sectors or organizations, such as financial services, for instance. Are there any examples you can share of ransomware attacks that have been successful so far? Yeah. Directed against hospitals and health systems? Yeah, unfortunately, there's several examples within the past couple of months. I don't want to name the hospitals because, again, they're victims. And mm -hmm. we always want a hospital uh, or any organization that's subject to these ransomware attacks to be treated as a victim. Sure. Um, where, in fact, some of the hospitals had to, where, where did not have the ability to restore their networks and data from backup, uh, we've seen instances of emergency departments being closed and ambulances being placed on full diversion, surgeries being canceled, um, 
and doctors, physicians, being unable to access the electronic medical records of patients. Mm -hmm. Huge issue, huge safety issue. I had a, uh, a department, a clinician uh, for an emergency department tell me that, John, this is a major issue. Even if a patient comes in and we think we know what the issue is, we can't access the electronic medical record to understand what drug allergies they may have, for instance. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's even a worst-case scenario if the patient comes in and is incapacitated. So lots of public health and safety issues when a hospital's become a victim of a ransomware attack, potentially. What are some of the steps that any hospital or health system can take to help mitigate the risk of an attack? Right. So again, the priority always is to ensure and protect the continuation of care delivery and, of course, patient safety. So one of the first steps we recommend is that hospitals identify any vulnerabilities which may be present in medical devices, especially those are which, which are considered life-saving, life-support medical devices, and patching those immediately. And there's other, there's other uh, methodologies to kind of secure those medical devices by you know, the network segmentation and so forth, certain monitoring tools. So patching of existing vulnerabilities, starting with medical devices, is the first priority. Now, most cyber attacks don't begin with a purely technical attack. It begins with a psychological attack. And what we mean by that? It's the end user, the individual who's usually targeted by the adversary to click on a email or an attachment which contains the malware. So first off, it becomes a psychological operation. They try to trick the staff by some seemingly innocuous or legitimate email being directed to them, enticing them to click on the malware, which actually uh, operationalizes the malware. So the point there is education of staff is critical. Strong culture of cybersecurity. Having the staff to be alert of those suspicious emails, and if there's any question at all, not to click on it, and to alert their information security teams. Tom, as a matter of fact, over 90% of 90% of all cyber attacks start with a staff member clicking on a email, a phishing email. Wow, 90%. 90%. That's, that's really amazing. So, and then just to finish the summary there, so patching, staff education, culture of cybersecurity, and then, of course, ensuring the security of your backup systems, ensuring they are offline, segmented, in multiple locations, on different media types. So if, in fact, somebody does click and you become a victim of ransomware, you have the ability to quickly restore your systems. Those are just a couple of the tips. Are these common sense steps that any hospital or health system has the capability to, to make on their own, or do you need some heightened level of expertise in-house to, to do this sort of thing? Uh, I think it requires heightened vigilance and focus, right? These are fairly common steps. But again, these are easy, easy things to say, but may be extraordinarily difficult to implement for a variety of technical reasons and so forth, and even funding reasons. Um, but those, uh, because they would potentially require some major uh, resource allocation and expenditure, and perhaps network configuration. Well, what outside resources can hospitals and health systems use or draw from to monitor the situation and stay on top of what they should be doing? Yeah, so most of, the, most of the information security folks belong to cyber threat intelligence and cyber threat information sharing groups. So to monitor the threat feeds that are coming from those organizations and, of course, to monitor the government threat feeds. Uh, their DHS and the FBI routinely uh, put out uh, threat intelligence bulletins, staying on top of those. Uh, those bulletins are very good. They include... Uh, it, technical indicators of compromise and steps, specific technical steps to be taken to help mitigate the threat. So those threat feeds are open to the public. You can sign up uh, for those for free. There's other organizations like the, uh, the Health Information Sharing and Analysis uh, Coordination Group uh, that push out information for free. So keeping that information flow and dialogue within the healthcare community 
Uh, I also recommend that they speak to their colleagues in other sectors. So, for instance, financial services, very advanced uh, capability. They get a lot of threat intel uh, as well. And leveraging that intelligence and that capability from other sectors uh, has been found to be very helpful for healthcare. And the reality is bad guys generally don't target just one sector. Mm -hmm. They go after all of them. So it becomes very relevant to share. One final question occurs to me. If nothing happens in the next, say, month, mm -hmm. does the threat recede or are we in a situation where you can never really relax your guard? Yeah. So net defenders out there listening know that they never relax. They, uh, they own the defense of the network. Um, just to give you an example, Tom, of the heightened state, the alert that they're always under, over 90% of all email traffic directed at organizations is usually blocked as malicious or spam, 90%. And that for some organizations, that's literally millions of emails a day. Mm -hmm. um, so in the Iran situation, I would say that continued vigilance is prudent and warranted. Iran has been known to retaliate and strike on their, their own timetable. And uh, as, I, as you mentioned, I did study Iran, was focused on them in some previous assignments at the FBI and CIA. And they have become very adept at leveraging the element of surprise. So again, heightened vigilance, heightened attention to some of those key fundamental cybersecurity steps I think is warranted and certainly can't hurt no matter what. Any final or takeaway thoughts you want to share with people before we uh, wrap up? Yeah, Tom. So, again, no specific credible threat of either a physical or cyber attack against the U.S. at this time. But, again, heightened vigilance, definitely warranted. This is a very good time to check some of those basic cybersecurity functions, procedures, including testing your incident response plan. Uh, that will serve you well, whether the threat comes from Iran or any place else. So we'll stay tuned. We'll continue to monitor the threat and make sure our members have the latest information. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, John, for your insights and advice. Much appreciated. My pleasure. For further information on this issue or other cybersecurity issues, please contact AHA Senior Advisor for Cybersecurity and Risk and former FBI Cyber Senior Executive John Rigi at jrigi at aha.org. That's J-R-I-G-G-I -G -G -I at aha dot org.